continue the study on the book of John. Today we'll be going on John chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And I always like to kind of give a little bit of a review. And in chapter 1, we had seen that Jesus was with his disciples. And, um, you know, he had met, he had this encounter with Nathaniel and Philip and, and Peter and Andrew and John. And, and Nathaniel had been um, where, you know, he, he all of a sudden said, oh, you know, Jesus, you know, I believe you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And, um, and Jesus tells him in John chapter 1, uh, verse 51, and he says to him, and I'm just going to read this because it kind of sets us up for chapter 2. But Jesus says to him, and he said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And Jesus had told him, you believe just by that, by me telling you that I saw you when you were under the fig tree? You haven't seen nothing yet, Nathaniel. You're in for so much more. And he tells him that, you know, from here on, you're going to see all of heaven's activities centered around the person of Jesus. So now we go to John chapter 2, and here we're going to see the very first miracle that Jesus ever performed. And we might think, oh, well, he healed somebody or he raised somebody from the dead or he fed the multitudes or cast out demons. That, that wasn't his first miracle. His first miracle was when he turned water into wine. And we're going to look at tonight why he did that. What, what's behind that, that, that first miracle that he did? It was with a purpose. And there was something um, that he wants to show us through that. So we're going to start with John chapter 2, verse 1. And it says, On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. So this was the third day after his encounter with Nathaniel, after he had said, you know, hey, you, you've got a whole lot more to see, Nathaniel. You, you've got more ahead of you. So there's this wedding. And it says that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there. And it says in verse 2, Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. So we see here, it's, it's a wedding, it's a happy occasion. Hopefully it's a happy occasion, a wedding should be happy. And, uh, and, um, but they come together, Jesus, his mother, the disciples, they're there. And um, a problem arises. Because even when there's a, a happy moment, you know, even when life is good, problems still arise. But if you invite Jesus from the get-go, if you invite Jesus to be there at your wedding, at your, at, in your family, then you know that when those problems arise, Jesus is right there and he's there to meet your needs. So, so Mary tells them, they've run out of wine. Now, we're going to look a little bit at the life of Mary. And we either go from one extreme to the other with her. Either, you know, some faiths, put her like way up here, like, oh, Mary, the, like almost to be worshiping her and, and putting Jesus to the side. Or sometimes we just ignore her altogether. But there's a lot of important things that we can learn from the life of Mary. And, um, and she was a woman of God. And isn't it strange that the very first miracle that Jesus created, that he did, was with a woman. And not just any woman. It was that woman of faith. Mary was a woman of faith. And, and so she comes. Because all this time, all along, she's been putting um, some things inside of her treasure box. You know, we have a heart. Our heart is like a treasure box. And since the very first time when the angels came and told her, you know, Mary, you know, uh, you're highly favored from God. And from the very first time that they said, you're going you're gonna to have a son, his name is going to be named Jesus, he is going to be the highest of the high, and, and all of these things. Well, you know, she was just a, a young girl, just a young girl, maybe 15, 16 years old. But she took the word of God, the word that the angel spoke, which was the word, the, he was a messenger, so it was the word of God. And everything that that angel said, she put it in her little treasure box. And she saved it there. 
And when she saw Jesus, when, when they took him to the temple and, and Simeon and Anna were there and they were saying, oh, you know, we see the one that will be the consolation of Israel. He's going to be mighty and great. She took those words, those words that came from God, that came from, it was a message to her from the Lord. And she took those words and she put them in her little treasure box. When Jesus was 12 years old and, and they couldn't find him, he was lost in the temple. And they're like, did you see Jesus? No, did you see Jesus? I, I thought he was with you. And they didn't know where he was at. And then they found him and he was there teaching the teachers. You know, he, he was giving the word of God. And Mary's looking and she's putting all those little treasures in her treasure chest. Right here, our treasure chest. Sometimes we guard things in our treasure chest that maybe we don't want to guard. But if we take, like Mary, and we take all those little things, the Bible says she pondered all these things in her heart. Then, you know, one day you can have a treasure chest full of the word of God, full of the promises of God, full of the things that God has done and wants to do in us and through us. And you have that little treasure chest box like Mary did. Okay. Well, so she goes to Jesus. She goes to Jesus and she says, okay, I keep missing my place here. Um, she says that, that they, they have no wine. And we're not going to discuss today whether you're drinking wine or not drinking wine or whether it was fermented. We're not going to discuss any of that because that's not the point. Okay. There's a, there's a different point in all of this. Okay, it could be cooling. It's okay. And verse 4 says, Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Wow. This sounds like a hard word. He doesn't say, Mary, mother of God, you know, pray for us sinners. He doesn't do that. He calls her woman. It, it sounds even like, like harsh, like he's just putting her aside. And he says, what, what is that to me? I'm just a guest here at this wedding. But see, Mary was taking a step of faith. Mary knew who Jesus was. She had been putting all those little treasures in her treasure box for years. And she knew who Jesus was. And he said, my time has not yet come. But you know, you know, as moms, it's like, uh-uh, son, it's your time. It's your time. The world has yet to know who you are. It is your time. And I know you're going to do something great and mighty here. Okay, on your paper, I want you, and I'm going to use my whiteboard here. I want you guys to write out the word woman. That's what he called her. It sounded harsh, but yet it was a term of respect. He was speaking to her respectfully. And he was speaking to her, not just as his mom, you know, okay, you know, you better go take out the trash, Jesus. No, he was talking to her respectfully as a woman of God, as a woman of faith. I want you guys to just write out the word woman, but we're going to write it this way, like an acrostic. Like this, okay? And we're going to, uh, we're going to jump a little bit to um, the book of Luke. And then we'll come back to John. So just kind of hold your finger there. And we're going to go to the book of Luke chapter 2. And this is, a you know, the story of, that we hear so much uh, during uh, Christmas time. But we need to look at these scriptures and so that we don't for, forget that they're for all the time. So the, the angel comes to her. And the first thing he says is to her, you know, he starts telling her what God's plan is. And then he says, don't have any fear. And, you know, she accepted that word. She knew God was going to do something, but she knew that fear always goes against faith. And so she believed what the angel said, and she put her fears to the, to the side. And then in verse um, um, 31, it says, uh, okay, now I'm going to go back. Luke 2, and he says, in 30, he says, Do not be afraid, Mary, if you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. It says there that she was going to have the divine favor of God. She could have said, no, I don't want it. No, I'm comfortable the way I am. No, I don't want to go through all of those things that I would have to go through. 
But she accepted the favor of God. She wanted God to do more in her life. She wanted the Lord to just show up and show off and do whatever he wanted in and through her life. So she accepted God's plan. She didn't know what the whole plan was, but she was willing to accept the favor of God on her life. And then he goes on, he's talking to her, and then she asks, uh, she asks, I'm going to skip some verses, in verse 37, she says, um, you know, but how will this be? She did not ask with doubt, but she just, she knew that she was a virgin, and she knew that there's no way that she could have a baby because she had not known a man. But the angel says to her, for with God, nothing will be impossible. And she took a hold of that, and she took it into her heart, she she put it into her little treasure chest that this baby that she was going to bring forth was the, the Jesus of the impossible. And when we have Jesus in our hearts, he's the Jesus of the impossible. There's nothing impossible for him. And then she says, and this is a beautiful verse, verse 38. Then Mary said, behold, the maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me a According to your word, and the angel departed from her. So Mary had a servant's heart. She said, I'm your maidservant. Whatever you want from me, God, whatever you want in my life, I am willing to, to serve you. Okay, we'll talk about it later, Gloria. Okay. Um, but she had that attitude of being a maidservant, a servant of the Lord. And we're going to see when we go back to John that that, that attitude that she's had of her heart, of humility, of being a thing that she's going to teach and impart to others. And then she says, be it unto me according to your word. She had God's word in her heart and she wanted to follow God's word. And then it goes on like once the, the angel leaves and she goes with Elizabeth later there in Luke chapter 2, she says, she says, um, that um, in verse um, 46, Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. So she says that word magnifies is like if you have a magnifying glass, when you look in a magnifying glass, like Gina was looking through my glasses right now, she says, whoa, you know, because they are magnified. They're making things bigger. And when we magnify the Lord, we're looking at him and we're making him bigger. Not that he's, he's he's God, but we're looking at him with bigger eyes and saying, Lord, you are big, you are large, you are great. So she magnified the Lord. Okay, so right over here, we're going to kind of do this together. And right here with the W, I want you to write the word, word. Word, W-O-R-D, okay? So she was a woman of the word. She heard God's word. You know, it came through an angel. It, it, it came in different ways, but she heard God's word. To be a woman of faith, the first thing, the most important thing is hearing God's word and putting it in your heart. You know, the scripture says, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Putting his word in our heart so you have something to pull from when you need it. Then with the O, you're going to put obedient. She was obedient. You know, sometimes I see things on Facebook. Sorry, Facebook. But I see things and I'll say, if you, you know, if you uh, love Jesus or whatever, push like. And inside me, I think, no, mm-mm. If you love Jesus, for the word O B E Y, obey. Anybody can click like, but it takes more to obey His word. If you love Jesus, Jesus said, "If you love me, obey me." That's the key. And Mary was an obedient servant, and and it, it says that she hurried to do the word. Faith always involves action, and faith always involves obedience. Okay. With the M, I want you to write the word magnify. M-A-G-N-I-F-Y. Magnify. 
So she began to praise God. And she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. She enlarged him in her heart. And her, her heart was full of praise for him. So a true woman of faith, a servant of the Lord, is going to magnify the Lord. Oh, this should be an A, okay? I'm sorry. An A, because I'm just talking to that one woman. Sorry. Okay. So A, she accepts. God's plan. She accepts God's plan. She accepts God's favor. You know, as I was going over this, I, I thought, Lord, what had what would have been in her life if she would have said, No, I'm just comfortable in my little city. I, I just want to marry Joseph and have babies the normal way. And sorry, Angel, but I, I'm not the one. She would have missed out. She would have missed out. On everything that God has for her and see the Bible says that you know he chose us before the foundation of the world and he has a plan for each one of us and he wants to give his favor to us and what would be of our lives if we say Lord I want your blessings your favor I want everything you have for me what would become of our lives and then on the other side what becomes of our lives if we say no Lord I, I don't want your plan. I, I want to do it my way. But Mary became so blessed among women because she accepts, she accepted the plan of God, the favor of God for her life. And then the last one, you can write there, no fear. No fear. She might have had some fear, but you know, fear is not... It, even if you have some fear, if you still act out in faith, then God can, will he'll meet you at that place. So she put her fear aside and she was a woman that walked in faith. And Jesus called her woman. He said, woman, you know, what, what is that? Is that my, what is that concern to me? And yet, you know, she didn't take no for an answer. She didn't say, sorry, sorry, people at the wedding. Um, my son just doesn't want to do it yet. He says it's not his time. She didn't say, she doesn't, didn't take no for an answer. If we go back and if we look at John chapter 2, okay. I'm sorry, John chapter 2, and I missed my face here, so I'm going to find it real quick. Once Jesus tells her that, and he says, my hour has not yet come, verse 5 it says, his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. <laughs> Did Jesus say yes? But he didn't say no either. Right. He didn't say yes, but he didn't say no. That's right. And so you know what? She took that step of faith and she said, oh, he didn't tell me no. So I'm going for it. I'm going for it. I want to see my son in action. And I, I'm the I'm a woman with a faith that 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 allowed the Holy Spirit to conceive this child in me. I want to see that first miracle. And Jesus gave her that first miracle. So you know what she says? She does, she just says, she's learned that it's the obedience to God's word has been the key to her blessings. She's learned that by being obedient, she has seen God do great and mighty things. When nobody was looking, Mary was being obedient. She was being obedient to the Lord. So she just said, oh, tell the servants, whatever he says to do, do it. Whatever he says to do, do it. Say that with me, ladies. Whatever he says to do, do it. Whatever he says to do, do it. That's the key. That's the key to seeing God's greatness. That's the key to seeing his miracles, his power alive in our lives. Just be obedient. So she tells the servants, whatever he says, do it. She takes that step of faith. Okay. Um, verse six. Now there were six, there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. So there they were probably looking like this, but much, much bigger, you know, big water pots. Each one holds 20 or 30 gallons and there's six of them. So if it was 20 gallons times six, that would be 120 gallons. If it was 30 gallons times six, that's 180 gallons. So that's a lot of water. That's a lot of water. 
And what does Jesus say? He says, he, the servants come and they're, they're there ready to, to, um, to do whatever he says to do. And Jesus said to them, verse seven, fill the water pots with water and they filled them up to the brim. So did Jesus ask something easy from them? Probably not. You know, a gallon of water is heavy and they had to fill up between 120 to 180 gallons. But you know, they did it. That's what he said. They didn't say, well, can we just fill them up halfway? You know, I mean, come on. You know, they're not going to be too heavy to carry and stuff. Can we just do it halfway? No. They listened to his instructions and they did it exactly the way he said. He, they filled it up to the brim. And you know, as I was thinking about this, I was like, you know, Lord, we're like containers. We're like containers. And, and we hold something inside of us. And, and these containers held water, just ordinary water, ordinary, everyday water. But Jesus was about to do something so amazing. He was going to take that ordinary water and transform it into wine. And not just the cheap Thunderbird stuff, but the really good stuff. The really good stuff. I'm not a wine drinker, so I don't know the names of them. But anyways. And, and you know, with us too, you know, he, he, I believe he did this miracle, the first miracle that he transformed the water into wine to show us that he wants to take whatever's ordinary inside of us. And he wants to transform our lives into something amazing. <coughs> And at a wedding, at a wedding, it was the union of two new people. It was called a covenant because it was this person coming together and making a whole new life. So at, at a wedding, a place of covenant, Jesus did this very first miracle. And see, up to this point, the people had lived under the Old Testament, which was glorious. It's, the Bible says that it was a glorious covenant. But it was a covenant that was fading away. And Moses had to put on a veil because it was fading away. But from the very first miracle, Jesus was showing that he's making a new covenant, a new union between us and him. That we could be filled with his new wine. The wine brought joy. The wine brought pleasure to people. It was something that brought celebration. And as he fills us up with his life, our joy can flow over onto others and, and be a reason to celebrate because of Jesus. So it was a symbol of the new covenant that he wanted to, to have with us. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on. Um, verse 8. And he said to them, okay, first he tells them, fill up the water pots. Fill up the water pots. You got your water pot? Fill it up. What are you filling it up with? Fill it up. That's the first thing that Jesus says. Fill it up. Fill it up to the brim. Okay. And then in verse 8, he says, And he said to them, Draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When they're taking it out, you know, it hasn't turned into wine yet. It wasn't like, okay, all of these water pots and, oh, yeah, look, they're all turning into wine. No, they had to take a step of faith because when they had filled it up, it was still just water. But the, the key came when they obeyed. He said, take some to the, the master of the ceremony of the wedding. They were the, the ones in charge to make sure that everything was running smooth. And they said, take some out and go take it to the master of the ceremonies. So that was a step of faith that they had to draw it out it's like, uh, yeah, Jesus, um, <laughs> hello, it's yeah. still water here. But that's, and, and the Lord calls us. He tells us sometimes to take a step of faith, and we don't see it. We want to see it first and then believe. But he says, no, believe first, and then you'll see. Because the just shall live by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. So it was in the taking of the of the, the little cup that they dipped into it. And they're like, okay, when's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? And somewhere, in, the, in between, by the time they got there, somewhere, maybe as they were about to serve it to that, that master of the ceremony, it turned into wine. And the man tasted it and he says, 
whoa, what's going on here? You know, usually when they bring out the, they serve the best wine and then when everybody's all drunk and everything else, they give them the cheap stuff because it doesn't matter anyways. But you save the best for last. And, and the, the man, the master of the ceremonies, he didn't know how it had happened. But there in verse 9, it says, when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and he said to them, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior, but you have kept the good wine until now. When we obey, that's the key to seeing what God wants to do. When we are obedient to him, he fills us up and he gives his, his, his life right here to us. And I want to just say something. It was the servants that got to see the action. It was the people, not the people in front of the camera. It was the people behind. It was the people that just every day, just obeying Jesus, every day obeying Jesus. And they were the ones that got to see his works. And if you look at the book of uh, Revelation, John, the, let's go ahead and look there. John, um, the, the author of this book, but now he's an old man. And Revelation chapter one, I just want to read real quick. Okay, chapter one, it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That word revelation means the revealing, mm -hmm. where you see Jesus, where you get to know him. You see him in a deeper way. It says the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. He, he gave the revelation to show who? To show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel. An angel is also a servant to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, who was a servant of all servants to all things that he saw. And so God teaches us that it's having a servant heart. A servant heart, a heart of obedience. And that's where you're going to see the blessing of God. God bless you.